Welcome to Break the Rules with Dr. Lauren Lax, a podcast dedicated to quieting the noise in the health, food, and fitness world. Dr. Lauren is a leading nutritionist, therapist, and functional medicine practitioner on a mission to help others thrive in their own lives, mind, body, and soul. And now, your host, Dr. Lauren Lax. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of the Break the Rules podcast where we talk about quieting the noise in the health, food, and fitness world. And today we're talking all about mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms, eating mushrooms, and really how mushrooms can help with our health, hacking our health. Jeff Chilton is in the house. He studied ethnomycology at the University of Washington in the late 60s, and in 1973 began a 10-year career as a large-scale commercial mushroom grower. Um, He is the co-author of The Mushroom Cultivator, as well as established Namex, his company, the first company to supply medicinal mushroom extracts to the nutritional supplement industry. So Jeff, I am just so excited to talk about a topic that um, there's a lot of misnomers about as well out there, or just not as much understanding around of how mushrooms can be super impactful for our health. And if you could just give us a little bit more background about who you are and what got you doing the work you're doing in the world. Well, I, I was raised in the Pacific Northwest up in the Seattle area. And, you know, what, what is Seattle known for? Rain. <laughs> it's, it's one of the best climates in the world for wild mushrooms. So I, I grew up with mushrooms all around me. I was able to get out and, and do some mushrooming uh, as a youngster. Mm-hmm. And then when I went to university, I, I studied anthropology, but I also, uh, they had a great mycology department there, which is the study of fungi. And so I studied uh, mushrooms while I was in university as well as anthropology. Uh, got my degree in anthropology. What do you do with a degree in anthropology? Well, not much. Mm-hmm. So in 1973, after university, I went down to the only mushroom farm in Washington State got a job, was there for the next 10 years, literally living with mushrooms. We were producing 2 million pounds of mushrooms a year. So it was a very, very large farm. And uh, I I loved every minute of it. That was awesome. And so that led you to then using mushrooms medicinally and talk a little bit about your discoveries there. Well, you know what? First of all, what's really interesting about mushrooms is that when I worked on this mushroom farm, at that time, classical nutritionists thought that mushrooms had no food value. So they were like, oh yeah, mushrooms. It's like, it tastes good, but there's nothing there. The reason they said that was because mushrooms are low in calories and high in fiber. (laughs) <laughs> interesting so, but and and as uh, more and more information came out of course we've learned that mushrooms are high in protein high in carbohydrates in fact protein of mushrooms is between 10 and 40 percent carbohydrates are 40 to 70 percent um, they have a good amount of b vitamins b1 2 and 3 uh, potassium phosphorus and high in fiber, which ultimately, as you know, feeds our microbiome. And the really cool thing about mushrooms is that part of that fiber is something called the beta-glucan. And beta-glucans, there's been a lot of research on mushroom beta-glucans that show they have immunological activities. And that's what basically makes mushrooms medicinal. So Dr. Lauren, we have a food that is not only a great food and will feed you and nourish you, but it's also medicinal. It's food as medicine. We were talking about that before the show, just the concept of using food as medicine. Talk to us a little bit about um, what makes mushrooms medicinal. And I know there's so many varieties out there. Talk a little bit about the different varieties and, and the components that they bring to the table. Sure, sure. Well, let me just start out and give you a little bit of an overview of this organism that we call a mushroom. It's a fungus. And and this is a, a kingdom that is the kingdom of fungi. It's between 
animals and plants. And this organism doesn't have seeds. Well, how do we grow something if we don't have any seeds? Mushrooms have spores. So in nature, these spores will, will uh, waft off on air currents, land on the soil, on, on uh, wood, on all sorts of organic matter in nature. You know, you know, the air we breathe is just full of spores and mm -hmm. you name it. Um, so when those spores germinate, they uh, germinate into a very fine filament that we call a hypha. And when multiple filaments come together, it forms a network. Uh, and this network is called mycelium. And the mycelium, what it does, it's breaking down organic matter. So, you know, all of the leaves, all of the plants that are annuals that will come up and then they'll die. And so we have all of this organic matter uh, every year that needs to be broken down and in a sense composted and turned back into humus. That's what this mycelium is doing. Now, when conditions are right, like in the Northwest in the fall, all of a sudden we get a lot of rain. The humidity goes up. Mushrooms need high humidity to grow. Um, so they'll come up, they'll um, uh, go through a cycle, uh, cap forms, it opens up. There's gills underneath the cap. That's where the spores are produced. And uh, then that completes the life cycle. So when you think about a mushroom, think about three different, what we would call plant parts. You, you know, with, with any plant, we've got the root, uh, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit. Well, with a mushroom, it is the spore, it is this mycelium, and it is the mushroom itself. Now, um, all mushrooms in their cell walls have what's called a beta-glucan. And these beta-glucans are uh, part of the structure of the mushroom, and they are what makes a mushroom medicinal. And each mushroom has a little bit different architecture of this beta-glucan. And what that means is that even though they all have beta-glucans, and that's part of the fiber in the mushroom, um, the ones with a certain configuration of that beta-glucan will be highly medicinal in the sense that they will boost our immunity. The other mushrooms, the beta-glucans, will act as fiber, which you know is really good for us and feeds the microbiome. But the mushrooms that have these special types of beta-glucans will be medicinal. And what's so wonderful is that certain of those, like shiitake, like maitake, like lion's mane, you can get those in your market. So you can go to the market and you can be purchasing mushrooms for food purposes and be getting the medicinal benefits as well. Yeah, there's so many varieties at the market. So we have portobello, we have, uh, I mean, shiitake, I don't think reishi is there. It's in uh, tea form. But talk a little bit about um, the different types of mushrooms and perhaps what they uniquely bring to the table. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, just to be clear, the major medicinal mushrooms, they share one major attribute, and that is these active beta-glucans. And what they do is they're, they're considered immune system modulators and, and uh, potentiators. And what that means is they will strengthen our immunity. And, you know, that's really one of the key issues with so many people out there is their immunity for whatever reason. It could be diet. It could be just general lifestyle. Their immunity is not very strong. Mushrooms will strengthen that immunity. They do that by essentially um, activating our immune cells and producing uh, helper T cells, uh, NK cells, macrophages. So this is essentially the basic property of being a medicinal mushroom. Now, different species have certain attributes that are really kind of interesting. Have you, have you heard at all much about lion's mane? I haven't heard a ton. I know that exists and I've seen it in supplements. 
Lion's mane has compounds in it that will stimulate what is called nerve growth factor. And nerve growth factor is a protein that we produce and it is there, it organizes and promotes nerve cell growth. And so this lion's mane will actually stimulate the production of this nerve growth factor. And they've got actual clinical trials that they've done in Japan that demonstrate that um, people who are taking lion's mane, and in this one test, two groups, a control group, and one group, you know, they take a test to start off with. And then um, after 120 days, they test them again. The group taking the lion's mane did much better on the test. And what was interesting is when they stopped taking lion's mane, they tested again 30 days later, and the group taking the lion's mane dropped back down to baseline. Really interesting. But, you know, what happens is that as we age, we tend to lose the production of this nerve growth factor. So anything that can help with keeping up high levels of that is really important for memory. They've even used lion's mane in trials for people with dementia. And, you know, you don't really notice anything like that now. I mean, we all, you know, go, oh, gee, I wish I had a better memory. And oh, that person's memory is so good and mine's not or something like that. But as you age, all of a sudden, it's like, huh, what was that person's name? Or what was that uh, I was thinking about? And it's just slipped my mind. So, so, anything that can help us with cognitive issues. And right now, are you familiar with the term nootropics? I I am. Brain. Lion's mane is in that category. Anything that can enhance our uh, basic sort of like functions, anything that helps us function at a higher level is, is in a sense a nootropic. Like my coffee this morning is, could be considered a nootropic. So lion's mane is, is a, high level nootropic and right now it's just amazing how uh popular it's been it's become it's one of our best selling products right now it's just uh, incredible so that's one of the mushrooms and what it does it's that is uh, along with its immunological activities um other ones maybe you've heard of how about uh, have you heard of reishi yeah tell us about reishi it's very popular, I think, right now. Have you, and- yeah, I know. Isn't that interesting? Because people and companies are putting mushrooms in almost everything these days. It's like, oh, my God, is there anything they're not putting mushrooms in? They're putting mushrooms in chocolate. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> reishi. Reishi actually has uh, – reishi in China is called the mushroom of immortality. <laughs> Can you imagine? Really? Why yeah, mushroom of immortality, and and it's considered well, it's considered a real longevity uh, herb, and they have certain herbs in China that are considered longevity herbs, and reishi is one of them. It's a beautiful mushroom. You ever seen an actual real reishi mushroom? Um, I haven't. Maybe not, but it's it's like it's uh, it's it's like a piece of wood. It's uh, when I was first introducing mushrooms to the supplement market, they have a show in Los Angeles called the Natural Foods Expo. And I was literally walking the floor with a reishi mushroom in my hand. And reishi is got a kind of a kidney shaped, beautiful spiral cap. It is red and reishi is hard like a piece of wood, you cannot eat a reishi mushroom. It's basically, you use it in a tea. And I was taking it around and showing it to companies and saying, would you like to, are you interested in putting mushrooms into your product line? Have you ever heard of medicinal mushrooms? Nobody had heard of medicinal mushrooms. This is 1990. And they just looked at it and they went, what is that? Is that real? Well, yeah, it is real. It's a dried mushroom and and it's just like a piece of wood. But reishi has these immunological compounds, the beta-glucans, and there's also got other compounds called triterpenoids. And triterpenoids 
give reishi its bitter taste because reishi is very bitter. And it also has, that's uh, the triterpenoids are very good for the liver and blood purification. I, I normally tell people you're only going to take as a supplement one mushroom. Reishi mushroom is the one to take for sure. And again, reishi mushroom is not something that you can actually eat. It's not an edible mushroom, only in the sense of you can drink it as a tea. So we have uh, lion's mane, we talked about reishi. How about we have cordyceps, right? What are the other medicinal mushrooms that are really... Wow, cordyceps, yeah. Well, you know, you know what's really interesting? Cordyceps. Have you ever seen a picture of cordyceps? I really have not, no. Cordyceps is called caterpillar fungus. The reason is that it has traditionally been wild crafted and, and it grows up in Tibet. And what happens is a caterpillar uh, in the late fall will hibernate. And while it's hibernating, there will be spores of cordyceps that will infect it and will grow this mycelium and start to consume it. So in the, in the next year, when it is supposed to emerge from being a caterpillar into a moth, instead, a little cordyceps grows out of it. And, and it is called winter worm summer grass. And it's been used for, for thousands of years as something when people are uh, have a serious illness, they're recovering, they're just kind of coming out of this illness, but they lack energy, they are fatigued. That's when they will prescribe cordyceps to these people. These days, I mean, can you imagine, uh, I can remember also having cordyceps and showing it to some companies in the 90s and it's a caterpillar with this little tiny blade-like fungus growing out of the caterpillar. And, and I showed that to some people and they were just like, I don't know what that is, but my customers are not going to eat caterpillars. So, so it was at the time, it was not really a product that anybody was very interested in. And, it, and what's interesting about cordyceps uh, is that Right now, the wild cordyceps sells for about $20,000 U.S. per dried kilogram. Wow. Two pounds of cordyceps for $20,000. Well, that's not um, something that's affordable for anybody. Uh, but we're able now to grow cordyceps, and so the price is much lower. But, but we now have access to cordyceps, and we can basically sell it to anybody and everybody. So that's really the wonderful thing about it right now. And so, so it, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people, what they use cordyceps now is they use athletes will tend to use cordyceps for just, you know, anybody who's dealing with fatigue of any sort. that's kind of where they've been using cordyceps and also just for overall energy and health. So cordyceps is, is used in that way. Um, other uh, other mushrooms out there that are, are uh, have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, information about them. You ever heard of chaga? I have. Yeah, chaga. I mean, it's like you go on the internet and chaga is everywhere, right? It's like yeah, so much info about chaga. Chaga is actually not even an actual mushroom. Chaga is uh, the fungus that actually infects a tree. And then as it is, is colonizing this tree, uh, the tree will react and will produce this, this chaga that grows off the side of the tree. And it's a dark, uh, irregular, really gnarly looking thing. And, and uh, chaga has been used for a long time, uh, hundreds of years uh, as um, something for stomach issues. So, I would normally recommend that to people if they're, if they're having, you know, I say if you have an irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease or something like try chaga because it has been used for, for uh, stomach issues. So, so try it out. Maybe, maybe that's something that will um, resonate with certain people. The other thing that's really interesting is that 
Chaga and Reishi both have a lot of um, research behind them that demonstrate antiviral activity. And, and right now, obviously, that's, that's a very interesting subject. So, you know, there are, in fact, right now we can hardly keep our products in stock because people are really um, worried and, and really want to keep their immunity up. You know, one of the, one of the major ways that they do research and testing in terms of viral activity uh, yeah, is colds. So colds are, are caused by a virus. And so they can actually get groups of people and then give them certain things and then just see how they react in terms of whether they get the cold cold or a normal flu during the season. So that's one of the interesting ways that they can test anything for uh, this type of antiviral activity. And it appears that certainly anything that can help boost your immune system uh, will be helpful. Chaga and Reishi are two that they have demonstrated have antiviral activity. Um, talk a little bit about quality of mushrooms. So since there is a lot of these in supplements, um, talk a little bit about how do we know the potency? I've heard, especially with cordyceps, that a lot out there on the market is really not that great. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what? It's really interesting because in this category of medicinal mushrooms, there are a tremendous number of products that are not genuine and you have to be really careful. And it's, I mean, it's so hard, isn't it? You walk into like a Whole Foods or one of your natural foods market and you look at the shelves. There are so many products there. How does one choose? How does one know? And what's happened in uh, the whole mushroom category is there are companies. Do you eat, do you eat uh, grains? I know a lot of people don't eat grains and a lot of people are paleo and things mm -hmm. like that. Are you, do you eat grains? Um, my body doesn't tolerate a ton of grains. No, I really don't. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I do eat grains. I, I, I can't get away from bread. I love bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but what, what happens is that, you know, mushrooms are really expensive to grow really expensive to grow and you go well they're not look at them they're out in the marketplace they can't be that expensive i buy them for you know three or four or five dollars a pound or something like that well yeah fresh mushrooms you can produce them in the united states and it's something where a farmer can can actually make a profit off them but remember with a supplement a supplement is a dried powder and a mushroom like most vegetables is actually um, ninety percent water. So when you dry out a mushroom, now all of a sudden, if you're getting five dollars for that fresh mushroom, you have to get fifty dollars for the dried pound of mushrooms. And and in terms of the supplement industry, that does not work. So you can't actually produce mushrooms in the United States and sell them as supplements. Um, it just doesn't work. That's why I uh, went to China in 1989 and I attended a conference there. And then for the next 10 years, I traveled all throughout China and, and I visited farms and processing factories and went to conferences and met with scientists. And, and it's just amazing. It, absolutely amazing the industry that they have over there for agricultural products and, and for mushrooms. China produces right now 85% of the world's mushrooms, 85%. And, and in 1997, I took OCIA with me, which is one of the world's premier organic certifiers. And we had the very first workshop for organic certification of mushrooms in China, 1997. And ever since then, we've been getting organically certified mushrooms. And again, these are certified by European certifiers, not Chinese certifiers, anything like that. You know, right now there's this whole war on China and real anti-China kind of thing. But the fact of the matter is, is that in terms of 
uh, their mushroom production and we grow them back in areas that are, are very clean. We test them twice, once before they leave, once when they arrive. Uh, we can't sell our products unless they meet all of the specifications for heavy metals or pesticides or any of that. So, so what happens is that because you can't grow mushrooms in the U.S., companies will grow that mycelium stage, that plant part stage, on grain, sterilized grain. They'll grow that mycelium on this grain in a laboratory. Um, so it's not like producing a mushroom naturally on its natural. Mushrooms grow on, medicinal mushrooms grow on wood. The wood is necessary to produce the precursors that will then allow that mushroom to produce its, its important medicinal compounds. This mycelium now is grown on the grain. And the, and the, the issue is that when, it's, when the uh, growth period has finished, which is 30 to 60 days, they will take that mycelium and dry it and grind it to a powder, grain and all. So if you're getting those products, what you're mostly getting is starch from the grain. Now, can you imagine, uh, have you ever gone to Paleo FX? Yeah, I'm here in Austin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've had a booth there. How come we haven't seen you? Maybe we have. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely, I run that show over there. <laughs> well, definitely, uh, um, you've got to come by the booth and maybe you have already, but we're there every year. And, and I have people coming up to me there and they go, oh, mushrooms. Man, I love mushrooms. And I'm like, that's fantastic. Uh, what supplement are you taking? And they tell me the supplement they're taking. And, and I tell them, well, you're getting mostly starch from grain powder and they're just like shocked, absolutely right. shocked. Now, can you imagine you're taking what you think is a mushroom supplement, but actually it's got very, very little of the actual beta glucans or any of the other medicinal compounds in there because it's mostly grain starch because they don't separate the grain out from the actual mycelium. So, so when you're looking for a mushroom product, a couple things you have to look for. If it says made in the USA, unfortunately, it's not going to be a mushroom product. It's going to be one of these myceliated grain products. Do you know what, do you know what tempeh is? I do, yeah. Do you ever eat tempeh? I don't. I, I prefer <laughs> meat. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like, I like meat too. Um, the, well, tempeh is actually cooked soybeans with mycelium grown on it. Oh, yeah. And when you look at tempeh, it's kind of a white block, whitish block. That whitish is mycelium. So... <laughs> That's what these companies are producing and grind, drying it and grinding to a powder and calling it a mushroom wow. when it is not a mushroom. So when you go into the, the uh, market and you're going, oh, I'm looking for a mushroom product and you look on the shelves and it all says reishi mushroom, lion's mane mushroom with a picture of a mushroom, it unfortunately in a lot of cases does not have any mushroom in it at all it's mm. it can very well be nothing but this grain powder with some mycelium in it so it's very very difficult at times one of the things to be looking for is does the product say anything about the beta glucans in there does it actually have a percentage of beta glucans most of these products won't measure anything because if they did it would mostly be measure, measuring starch so they, they don't really say much. Sometimes they'll say polysaccharides, 40%, 50% polysaccharides. Grain starch is, is a polysaccharide. So they're measuring their grain starch. So that, if you see a polysaccharide in, uh, a claim on that product, just <laughs> keep moving because you'll know that that's probably one of these products. So, so 
these are the ways that you can you can actually see and know, but be very careful because even the people in the natural product store or the whole foods or whatever, even they don't really know anything about mushroom products. All they know is what the, what the companies and their salespeople come in and tell them that's all they really know. And so they, they'll sometimes be recommending one of these products. as a really good product, not knowing the issues that are involved there. So it's very important to be, educated about this. And you know, Dr. Lauren, that's what I, I spend a lot of time doing is, is just trying to educate people to that fact. And, and, you know, for me, it's like, look, I'm not here to sell you on my products or anything, uh, but I want you to be educated and to be able to make an educated um, decision. Yeah. So what would be like the key things for a person to look at on a label or would it be pretty like over... Uh, safe to assume that most things sold on the store at grocery shelves are, are probably not the best and they should order online, talk to the manufacturer. What are your recommendations? Well, what I'd say is, is one, you know, look at the supplements facts. In the supplement facts, some of those companies will actually say mycelium. And then if you look down in the other, the fine print, it will say myceliated oats or 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 rice or something like that so look for that uh, if, if it says that you know for sure that's what it is um and and also if you see if it says made in the usa you know that it's one of those products because there are no genuine mushroom products that are actually grown and made in the u.s that just aren't because it's too uh too expensive i mean Think about this for a second. When, when I'm on the mushroom farm working there, we grow 2 million pounds of, of mushrooms and every crop that we've got produces 20,000 pounds of mushrooms, every single crop. And we, we put in four new crops every week and throw out four old ones. So we got a, a cropping cycle going on. In those 20,000 pounds, there's probably uh, a million mushrooms. Every one of those mushrooms is picked by hand. Mm -hmm. There are no machines that harvest mushrooms. Every single mushroom that you've ever seen in the market has been picked by hand. It's not cheap. It's very expensive to actually grow mushrooms. So this is something that you have to understand about mushrooms and, and why they can't be grown for supplements in the United States. Well, I guess like one other big question that I get asked a lot and then I think it goes around in the blogosphere it's just the use of mushrooms in general can be contraindicated in folks that have candida, mold, fungus in their body, mold illness um, in particular as well, and taking it supplementally and eating them. Talk a little bit about the truce or the not truce about that. Well, you know what? That idea has been around since the 90s, and I, I just call it an urban myth. And, and everybody I know who, is, who has been interested in that has tried to find some scientific basis for it. There is none out there at all. And, and are you familiar with what's called the doctrine of signatures? Um, I'm not. Doctrine of signatures sort of is like like produces like. So, for example, a doctrine of signatures would be like if you see something that is shaped like a kidney, a food or a supplement or something, you'd say, oh, that must be great for the kidneys. It's kind of that same idea that, oh, gee, if you have a fungal infection like candida, and candida is a yeast, if you have that kind of infection, don't, don't eat mushrooms because the mushrooms are, have an affinity for candida. It's just... There's actually no basis for that kind of thinking at all. So I, I actually know 
clinical herbalists that use medicinal mushrooms for candida. Uh, so, so no, there's nothing there. And, and, you know, let's talk for a minute about molds. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the fungal kingdom is divided into a couple of branches, one of which are called perfect fungi. And those are the uh, mycelium and that will produce a mushroom. And then there's a whole nother area called imperfect fungi. And those are the molds. And we do have to be careful about molds for sure. I mean, some molds like um, a mold called aspergillus will produce an aflatoxin. And that's something that is very important to look out for in the grain industry because when grain is stored, it uh, if it gets wet, well, a mold can get in and start to grow and then this particular mold will produce a toxin that's very deadly. So that's something that the grain, um, the people that are selling grains and, and are looking for all the time. Now, the other place you might see a mold is uh, on bread. We've always seen, all seen molds on bread, right? And, and if you see it in the beginning, it looks kind of white. That would be the mycelium. When it turns green or black, what is happening is it's producing spores. Now, the key for most of us, because we're not normally exposed to aflatoxins, but the key for most of us are those molds that are either in our kitchen on breads, or maybe if you're living in a place with high humidity, the mold that is growing inside your house, maybe in a, a damp spot, maybe it's growing on some uh, cloth, uh, your drapes, or growing on the walls or something like that. The issue with the mold is breathing the spores. That's the issue because it's not, we're not going to be eating it or anything like that. I mean, essentially, uh, the whole thing is that as it grows and propagates inside your house, it will be producing spores. And, and you know that because you'll be able to see, for example, that it's uh, dark black or something. And then, then if you even blow on it or something, you see this cloud of spores come up into the air. So you have to be really careful not to breed those spores because what happens is those spores will produce, they'll get into the lungs and they will be a lung irritant and they will be, uh, you can even have uh, allergies triggered by these mold spores, sometimes even worse types of infections from them. But that's where, you know, you, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna try and clean an area that's got mold in your house, be sure to wear a mask and, and and know that when you start to clean it, those spores are going to get into the air and spread. So you have to be very careful when you're cleaning it off. Mask, maybe go very slowly not to get it to where you get clouds of these. I mean, I mean if it's really extensive, I mean, that's what you're looking at. So you have to be very careful. But that's that's primarily where molds are affecting us, especially in a place like Austin with the high humidities that you can get there sometimes. And, and so you just have to sort of catch them before they get well established and start to uh, sporulate in a major way. So your advice is don't worry about eating mushrooms or supplementing with mushrooms. That really is a different type of fungus than this, the toxic mold spores. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, like I say, the whole, the whole eating mushrooms, if you have a candida infection, uh, infection is a pretty much what I call an urban myth. And again, nobody has ever shown any scientific evidence for that. It's just kind of one of those, like I say, docking of signatures that like somehow feeds or produces like, and mm -hmm. so there's no real basis that I've ever found for that. And I would imagine too, just from a supplement perspective, what you educated us on, perhaps it's more the fillers and supplements that are more contraindicated. Folks don't really recognize, realize if someone does have gut issues, that those are the bigger problem. Well, they can be certainly. I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, some of the testing that we do 
uh, you know, because we do beta glucan testing and that also tests for starches as well. And we find that, that some of these products are so full of starch and, and, you know, if people are very sensitive to starches and grains, then boy, you would really not want to be taking these other, other so-called mushroom products that are made on the grain and are mostly grain. That would not be, not be a good thing for you. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, this has been so enlightening. Thank you for helping us come break and shake up some rules uh, in this uh, space of mushrooms. <laughs> so where can people find out more about you and the cool work you're doing in the world? Well, my website is namex.com, N-A-M-M-E-X.com. And uh, I've got a lot of educational information there. I've got some slideshows too that people can can see can, can visit our farms because it talks all about the farms i've got slideshows of how we make our extracts so there's a lot of great information for people and then we have a retail online store called realmushrooms.com so they can go to that if they're interested in in trying out the products very cool i'll definitely put links in the show notes and thanks so much for coming on Hey, you're welcome. It's really been my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Dr. Lauren. 